and welcome to the Just and Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. Just a quick reminder that this program and everything that we do with Just and Center as an organization is supported by donors. So if you would like to contribute and help with the work that we accomplish here, please go to justandcenter.org. Go to our donate page. You can sign up for a certain amount um, each month, or you can give a one-time donation. And any gifts that you give really help us so that we can continue to do the things um, that we do. Uh, and among the things that we do, one of those is the the Widener Institute. Now, it's been a while since we have um, offered seminars. There have been a number of reasons for that. Um, but we are going to be starting them up again this year. So we have a few of them that we're planning. The first one is going to be announced very soon, and it will be happening this fall. So keep an eye out for that. If you want to join us, you can join us live, and uh, you'll be able to ask your questions and listen to our presenter there. So you'll be hearing an update on that. Hopefully by next week, I'll have the specific details and date coming up. So um, as I've been doing a series of podcasts on Trinitarian theology, we've been looking at some of the more in-depth questions about Trinitarian theology, looking at contemporary debates surrounding the nature of what is social Trinitarianism, what is classic Trinitarianism, how it is that we can kind of compare and contrast those two things, why the classical model I think works much better than the social Trinitarian model that's been proposed within the last hundred years or so. And something that I have mentioned a number of times is a book that I that I really enjoyed that I've read not too long ago, and this is Adonis Vidu's book, The Same God Who Works All Things, Inseparable Operations in Trinitarian Theology. Um, I might contact Vidu and see if he wants to do a discussion on this. That would be really helpful, probably. Um, but I wanted to just go through a little bit of the material in this book, and, and particularly... Um, I've gotten some questions after the last podcast on social Trinitarianism, but these are questions that I've gotten a lot, actually, from, from the very beginning, um, of people who are concerned that a social Trinitarian or a, a classical Trinitarian approach, especially uh, in the inseparable operations doctrine, um, the, the concern that I've heard from many is that it sounds like modalism. Um, so if you're not familiar with modalism, that's the idea that the Father, Son, and Spirit are simply different manifestations of the one God, or God appears in different modes. This is something that's existed really since the beginning of church history. This is one of the earlier heresies in the church, um, was a, a, a doctrine of a kind of modalism, um, which has an up Sabellianism. There are a number of different forms and names, and it's, you know, gone on throughout the years under many different forms. Michael Servetus was a modalist of a kind who was very well, I don't know, very popular. He's very well known, at least, and infamous more than anything else, but um, who knowingly was killed in Calvin's Geneva for his anti-Trinitarian views and other things. Um, but there are forms of it that exist today. If you think of people like the Oneness Pentecostals, they are, are modalists as well. So, uh, rightly, people are concerned about modalism, knowing that, well, it's an error if you if you just kind of flatten out the person's so that there is essentially one person or one divine essence that is a single person who just at different times appears in different modes. So there's a concern when we speak about inseparable operations, where, for example, in the last program I talked about, when we're talking about the three articles um, you know, of creation, redemption, and sanctification, that though we often speak about creation as the work of the Father, redemption as the work of the Son, and sanctification as the work of the Spirit, that while... It's not wrong to, to talk in those ways. It is wrong to assume that because we're speaking about the Father usually, and we usually attribute creation to the Father, it would be wrong to say that only the Father creates, and that the Son and the Spirit do not create. And the same with redemption, and the same with sanctification. So the concern that I keep hearing is that there is now a kind of flattening out or conflation of the three persons, because once you start saying there was only one will and one work, which is what I have said, uh, that there is one work, not three separate works, that now what we've done is conflated them. So essentially, we're uh, just I'm just a Unitarian now, and we have just one Unitary God who maybe has, is in some way shows himself as three persons, but is it really three persons? Um, and, and this is the, the difficulty of Trinitarian theology, of course, is always the, the balancing act of trying to give the proper attention to the distinctiveness of the three persons, that there really are three persons, um, on the one hand, 
but then also affirming the unity of God on the other. So any Trinitarian model and debate you have is going to affirm both the unity of God, the oneness of God, and the triune nature of God as well. And so how exactly do we balance these things well? And a lot of modern social Trinitarian theologies from the argument that I've made, and many others have as well, is that they have really focused so much on the distinction of persons that they have created a kind of tritheistic system so that the only thing that's really uniting the persons at all is a kind of common will or purpose, even though they all, all three persons have really separate wills that just kind of align themselves with one another so that there is a oneness of community, but it's not particularly that distinct from tritheism. That's the argument, at least, that, that I have been making, and I will continue to make that argument. Uh, but in light of that, I want to answer some questions about how the three persons relate. So I want to clarify this, and then I'm going to get into some quotes from this book where he delves into um, some of the, the biblical passages, because one of the critiques I keep hearing is this is all philosophical, it's not biblical, which, okay, I get, because it does get very philosophical. Uh, and I don't apologize for the fact it gets philosophical, but it, it does when you're talking about Trinitarian theology. Um, but of course, as as a Protestant, <laughs> one who who believes that ultimately it is Scripture that is that is authoritative, uh, that that Scripture has the final say in terms of determining what doctrine is, uh, rather than philosophy or church tradition. Uh, as much as I find those things useful, they do not determine our doctrine. Uh, they help us shape and form doctrine and present it in various ways, but they don't determine what, what is true and what is not. That's scripture. So in light of my convictions as, as a Protestant, um, I certainly believe we have to be able to find these doctrines in scripture. So not just in terms of philosophical discourse, and I think we can find them in Scripture. So we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of that and look at some of the passages that Vidu brings about to, to define his point. And just if you want to really get into this, this is a really good book. Just read the book, um, because I'm just going to be summarizing parts of it. And uh, and I think really the book is, is very helpful on its own. Uh, you know, this is pretty deep stuff, so it's not like it's the easiest thing in the world to read, but it's... I think you can navigate it pretty well for a, it's well written and I think well explained for a book that's on a pretty intense topic that's not always the easiest thing um, to follow. So to clarify, when we say that the three persons all work together in any work, that is not to say that there is no distinction between the persons in that work or exactly how that work works itself out in relation to the three persons. So, for example, if we're talking about creation, uh, and we say that, well, at creation, the Father is present, in the beginning was God, and the Father speaks so that it is attributed to the Son, and the Spirit is present here hovering over the water. So we have the, the creation account, uh, we have the Father, the Word, and the Spirit all present. When we say that, that creation is a Trinitarian act, and that the three persons are working inseparably toward that goal of there being a creation coming ex nihilo, out of nothing. That is not to say that there is no distinction between the Father, Son, and Spirit in that act. So it is not a flat act. In other words, it is the Father who speaks, that is the word, through the Spirit. Creation comes. And we'd say the same of redemption, right? We'd say redemption is the work of the Father, Son, and Spirit, so we're not going to separate it to say it's only the Son who's active in redemption. And every single element of redemption includes the working of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That's what we're saying with inseparable operations. So we can't say, well, this act was only the Son, or this act was only the Spirit, or this act was only the Father. However, that does not mean there is no distinction between Father, Son, and Spirit in those acts. So, for example, the Incarnation, it has been considered a, a Christological heresy to say that the Father became incarnate or that the Spirit became incarnate. The Father did not become incarnate. The Spirit did not become incarnate. The Son became incarnate. So, that does not mean, however, that the Father and the Spirit had nothing to do with the Incarnation or that the Incarnation meant that now the Son was acting independently of the workings of the Father and Spirit. So all of the workings of God are together, though we can still distinguish them uh, as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit 
all cooperate and work together in the act of the incarnation, and not just in the incarnation itself, but in every single aspect of Christ's life as it is lived out. And this principle of inseparable operations is something that when you look at, say, the Lutheran Orthodox, and I think uh, Heineke has a really good section, Adolf Heineke has a good section on this in his Evangelical Lutheran Dogmatics, um, where we see that you look at the various acts of things like the resurrection of Christ, right? We have the resurrection of Christ at various points in Scripture is attributed to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we see this with various acts of things like creation. It's attributed to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, the doctrine of election, for example. Election is at various points in Scripture attributed to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit. And so it's a general principle that we do see outlined that we see these acts that often we usually would say, well, election is the Father, creation is the Father. The resurrection is maybe the Spirit. But all three divine persons are at different points um, given credit for those things. And we understand this to say there is one working that flows from Father to Son and Spirit. So this doesn't mean there's no distinction, but it means that every act of God is a triune act. So there's nothing the Father does without Son or Spirit. There's nothing the Son does without the Father or Spirit. There's nothing the Spirit does without um, the Son and the Father. So they are, they are all cooperating, working together in those acts. And not acting as three separate individuals in the way that human people would cooperate together, say, in a team. There is one unified will that goes from Father to Son to Spirit. But there is that ordering that is Father to Son to Spirit. So there is a first, second, and third in the Trinity, in the Triune Godhead. And so we're not erasing those, those distinctions. So, but that means that, that every act is a triune act. And I actually think this guards against modalism. Because once you start saying things like, well, if you say, well, creation's just the Father, redemption's just the Son, sanctification's just the Spirit, what you end up with is, is it's almost as if God acts solely as Father here, he acts solely as Son here, and he acts solely as Spirit here. You see, that could lend itself toward an understanding that says God becomes Father at this moment, Son at this moment, Spirit at this moment, when we are, when we're understanding these things from a Trinitarian, classical Trinitarian perspective, we're saying, no, every single act that God does is Father, Son, and Spirit all together, so that this actually negates a, fl a flattening out of the persons in that sense. So there is this dynamic Trinitarian act that is always happening. So when we say one work between Father, Son, and Spirit, it means that that one work flows from Father through Son through Spirit. That makes sense. And um, okay, so we can we could talk about that from from the scriptural text. But hopefully that helps clarify to some of you who are a little confused about this. And and I get why it's confusing. Um, as I mentioned before, like I didn't have my Trinitarian theology straight when I started doing these podcasts. Honestly, I'm sure you could go back and find things that I've said that now I regret that I said. And a lot of the modern kind of Trinitarian Renaissance you're seeing among a lot of Protestant theologians, uh, a lot of us uh, have seen things that we probably regret saying. I'm just thankful that I'm young enough that I didn't publish a bunch of things before then, <laughs> you know, but uh, like we, we grow as theologians and, and, you know, there are plenty of things that I'm sure that I will kind of recognize I maybe didn't speak as well on in the future as well. I mean, that's just kind of how this, this thing works. Um, so I've, and it's not that I've substantially changed, but I've kind of recognized certain things. Oh, that's not a healthy way of speaking. And um, I think that, you know, many others are, are doing the same thing, but it's understandable to be confused because th this is an in-depth and complex topic, uh, and I think we have to we have to understand that and um, be a little bit gracious with one another on some of these issues. Um, okay. So I want to know, go from there. So hopefully that corrects some misunderstandings. Now we're going to go from there, jumping into the material in, in Vidu's book. And so I have just some, um, I have some things marked off here that I, that I want to talk about. Um, the, the beginning of this book is you got the intro and then you've got the section on a, a biblical theology of inseparable operations. And so I want to ask the question, is this doctrine of inseparable operations biblical? And I've already given some examples of why I believe that it is, but we'll look at some things that, that Vidu brings out here. Um, because this is a doctrine that I understand gets very philosophical. And a lot of times we're talking about church history. And those things are certainly essential for us in establishing doctrine, but the foundation always has to be scripture. You know, we're I coming from a Protestant, a Lutheran tradition, a, 
a Protestant scholastic tradition, uh, one which recognizes the authority of, of history and the councils and creeds to an extent, but as a secondary authority that is always judged by the primary God-breathed authority, which is Scripture. And so the primacy of Holy Scripture in establishing doctrine that can critique history, tradition, all of those kinds of things, even our, our reason, rationality, all of that. Scripture has to have the authority over these things. So it's necessary for me and my tradition to say that this is a biblical doctrine. Not just that it's something that is kind of a nice, pious opinion throughout history, but that it is taught in Scripture and that it flows from the teaching of Scripture, even if the language and wording and categories and stuff are things that develop later. That's fine. Uh, and we do that all the time. And I think that's actually necessary in terms of the development of theology, so long as the actual theology itself, the doctrines themselves, are founded upon uh, in the pages of Holy Scripture. So that's essential. So uh, Vidu, I think, does a pretty good job in, in delving into this. He has a description of Jewish monotheism as it's understood in the Old Testament. Now, there's there's a lot of debate about uh, monotheism and what monotheism actually means and what it meant for a first century Jew in particular. Uh, I don't want to get into a lot of those debates, but uh, Bidu does do a pretty good job overviewing a lot of that. Um, but essentially, we're, we're talking here about the oneness of God, and we're asking the question, what does the oneness of God me mean, and how in the New Testament in particular does the oneness of God relate to now Jesus' identity as God and now the Holy Spirit and his identity as God? How do the three these three divine identities, as people often speak of today, how, how do these exactly work together? How does Jesus share an identi divine identity with the Father? Or does Jesus share a divine identity with the Father? Um, so on page uh, 23 here, uh, he has a section called Jesus Identified with the Creator. He's largely drawing on Richard Bauckham. Now, Richard bauckham has been highly influential in this area, probably the most influential New Testament scholar in this area, but, but pretty much anybody else um, in terms of this notion of divine identity, where Richard Bauckham argues that Paul essentially, the Apostle Paul essentially takes the, the Jewish Shema, the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And in writing to the Corinthians, he he uses that phrase God to refer to the Father and Lord as Jesus Christ, right? For us, there is one God and one Lord, uh, Jesus Christ. So that he is essentially taking that identity of one God and giving that to the, those two persons. He's saying that identity of God includes the Father and it also includes the Son within that divine identity. Um, so that's that's Bauckham's uh, contribution here that he is talking about, uh, that, he, that he draws on. So we have that unity of the Father and the Son that is really essential for New Testament theology, that's essential for all Trinitarian theology. But then we have the additional question then. So we say, okay, that divine identity includes Father and the Son, but then we have the question, okay, does that mean, though, that there is one divine working that is that one working of the Father and the Son, or is there a separate working of the Father from the working of the Son, even though they're both included in divine identity? So does the unity of the divine identity necessitate a unity of divine act and divine will between those two persons? And we're going to look at some passages in John that certainly seem, I think, to say that that is the case. And, and Vidu, I think, does a good exegetical, um, d does a good job exegetically delving into some of these particular passages, and we'll look at them in the Gospel of John. Okay, uh, then we have the question of the relationship uh, between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I have a quote from him that I want to read on page 31. Uh, Vidu says, Trinitarian inseparability does not only extend to the relations between Father and the Son, which is often what we're talking about, specifically in those John passages, um, and the Spirit and the Father, on the other hand, equally inseparable are the operations of the persons of the Son and the persons of the Spirit. So he has here then in kind of an outline of how the Son relates to the Spirit in arguing for this one work, this identity between um, you know, Son and Spirit as both as part of the divine identity, but also having one divine energy, one divine will. Um, so he, he points to, for example, the, the Spirit being present in the life of Christ uh, from his very conception. Certainly the Spirit is, that, is present at that conception of Christ and instrumental in terms of the, the creation of the human nature of Christ. 
Um, okay, the framework for this constitutive association between the incarnate Son and the Spirit is given by the eschatological expectation of God's anointed. He points to various passages in Isaiah, Isaiah 11, 42, and, and 61, that you have the when the messianic figure is prophesied in the Isaianic text, there, the, the anointing of the Spirit as part of that sonship of Jesus. Those two things are, are intimately connected. So uh, we have these uh, the, these various texts in the Old Testament that tie the Son and the Spirit together here in their work. Then he goes on to say, John has already stoked the expectation that one will come whose baptism will be far superior to his, a baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Also hearkening back to the Isaiah and Joel prophecies, interestingly, in light of our conclusions to the previous section, Mike Habitz finds a most obvious reference to the activity of God's Spirit in creation, just as Genesis 1-2 spoke of him as brooding above the waters. So the point is that we have this connection between the Son and the Spirit that is there from the very creation account itself. And I think we see this very much in the baptism of Christ. So John is already talking about Jesus' baptism is the Spirit baptism because this is one work. Jesus baptizes, that is the Spirit baptizing, that is the Spirit baptism. So it flows from Jesus through the Spirit as one singular act. Certainly you see this being kind of inaugurated at the baptism of Jesus as the Spirit descends upon the Son in the form of a dove. Um, and I don't want to read uh, a ton more of, of these passages. Um, maybe I can read just something quickly here before I move on to the next part. Uh, maybe here's here's a, a good passage to point to. I think this one's helpful. This is in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Um, and here's the great, this is the great resurrection chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians. And in that chapter, Paul gives this uh, comparison, just as he does in Romans 5, between Adam and Christ. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, So it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam, being Jesus, a life-giving spirit. Um, so it's important that he refers to Jesus as a life-giving spirit here. And we have a, this is a, a quote from Fatehi from his book, R Risen Lord, which I'm actually not familiar with. So this one, I don't know, like I do Bauckham's, uh, but he says that he summarizes what Paul is doing in this text with the following words. By calling risen Jesus's life a pneuma, he redefines the Corinthian experience of pneuma in terms of Christ. That is, he elucidates that their pneumatic experiences were experiences of the risen Christ. Thus, Christ is a source as well as the pattern of the Corinthians' pneumatic experience. So we see here that the way that Paul describes the relationship between the Christian and the spirit is that it is an encounter with Christ. So that it is the, the spirit of Christ. So that what the Spirit does is what the Son does, just as what the Son does is what the Father does. Um, so we we have. I'll, I'll read this one more one more quote here. It's from the same from the same book here that um, Vidu is quoting. In other words, one should not speak merely of the Spirit playing the role of Christ, or of the Spirit only representing Christ. Rather, there is a sense in which the risen Lord Himself is actually present and active through the Spirit which is hardly imaginable without there being some ontic or ontological connection between the two. So you see that if Christ is actually present in the Spirit, we have uh, here we have this doctrine of perichoresis, which is where the one person is, where one is, all the other two persons also are. So as we encounter the Spirit, we also encounter Christ, because the, the union is that is that intimate between uh, the triune persons, in that if the Spirit is active in us, that means it's also Christ, because it is one act that flows from Father through Son through Spirit. All right. Um, so I think that's that's uh, helpful. Again, you can read the text yourself if you want to delve a little more in depth. Um, and we'll look at some of these passages then uh, that Vidu cites in Scripture. Well, let's look at then some of the biblical texts, because that's that's going to be really key. I just gave you some brief summaries there. And some of it is summary, because it's not like there is a... Um, we're talking about this. It's not like there is you know, one extensive, you know, chapter in scripture that's all about the doctrine of inseparable operations or something. Um, and so I'm going to look at John chapter five. And this is, this is the text that uh, Vidu spends quite, quite a bit of time on. And this shows up in all of these conversations. This shows up in any real Trinitarian dialogue that you have that deals seriously with the New Testament text. Uh, and understandably, as we look, as we look at this, so 
uh, John 5 is a text um, where we have one of the instances where the Jewish leaders are uh, are approaching Jesus and criticizing him. And as you read through the Gospels, of course, there are numerous things that uh, the Jewish leaders who don't like Jesus are trying to, to kind of get him on, to find a place where he, you know, breaks the law or breaks their traditions and that they can use this as a way to kind of accuse him and show that he's not who he claims to be. Uh, and so one of these famously is uh, Jesus heals uh, at Bethesda, um, not Bethesda, the video game company, um, on the Sabbath day. And then these Jewish leaders come to seek out Jesus and accuse him of, of breaking the Sabbath. So we have uh, obedience to the Sabbath, which is the third commandment in a Lutheran numbering, fourth commandment in other Protestant numberings. Um, but in response to this, Jesus starts to speak about his relationship to the Father. And it's in that response that we have a pretty lengthy discourse that speaks to us about the interrelation between the Father and the Son. All right, so I'll just, I'll just read a little bit of this. This is John, starts in John 5, verse 16. Uh, okay, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Uh, so, and he goes on longer than this as well, and the rest of this passage does have some relevance, but the key is really these verses here. So, Jesus is speaking about the relationship between the Father and the Son. Now, I think it's it's key to look at what's going on to say what the, the, the Jews, as they're called here, but the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, uh, what they are understanding Jesus to be saying. Because when Jesus makes these statements— they recognize that Jesus is making himself equal with God. So the way in which they understand these statements of Jesus is that he is making himself equal with the Father. And the question is, was it wrong for them to understand Jesus to be saying that? Or was it a correct understanding of Jesus to say he really was making himself to be equal with the Father? No, I'm going to say the latter. Now, we have a couple of specific things that are mentioned here in this text, and these are divine works. So, Vidu says, this is on page 37, he says, Among the kinds of things that the Father is showing the Son are raising the dead, as we see here, and judgment. These are exclusively divine prerogatives, as we've noted previously. So, this, he deals with this earlier in this chapter. So, if the Jews are seeking salvation, they could find it only through the Son to whom the Father has entrusted these prerogatives. So, it's clear that they are recognizing here that Jesus is taking what are clearly divine acts, raising the dead, judgment, and then he's applying them to himself. Because he says, you know, he gives to ever, whomever he will, the Son will. So, on the one hand, he's saying he only does what the Father does, but then on the other hand, he's also starting to say, well, I do what I want to do. How do those two things work together? What's going on here? All right, so how are we to interpret this text then in light of this? Now, we see here that Vidu makes a good point. He says the text tells us the son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. He says this is not a statement about some works of the son, but it's an absolute statement of total dependence. So every single thing that the son does, according to this text, every single thing that the son does, he does not do of his own, but it's the work of 
the Father. So there is this kind of absolute dependence upon the working of the Father in every single working of the Son. And in a lot of social Trinitarian frameworks, granting that there are many different social Trinitarian frameworks, but in many social Trinitarian frameworks, this simply wouldn't be the case. Because if the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all have these separate workings, there are plenty of things that the Son does that aren't necessarily the workings of the Father. Uh, because, say, the Father makes room for the workings of the Son and allows him to do what he will. This is not how Jesus himself seems to express it in this in this particular text. Um, and and Vidu gets into some of the interpretations of uh, various New Testament scholars. He talks about the, the, the doctrine of Philo, of these like two powers. And, and there are certainly some connections between Philo and his understanding of the Logos and in God of the Old Testament. Uh, and Philo's an interesting figure uh, to that degree. But uh, then he cites... You know, Boltmann, who's always fun to read, and, and others. So uh, he cites then as a, as a commentator who he thinks gets it right, Herman Ritterboss. Um, Herman Ritterboss, has a, he's got a really great work on Paul that um, is certainly worth reading through. That's my, my familiarity with Ritterboss is largely through, through his work on Paul. Um, but he says here, Ritterboss points out that seeing and hearing alternate in the Gospel of John between past and future. And he says this, from this alternation, it is clear that in seeing and hearing in this text in John 5, we are dealing with neither just a program that the Father has given the Son once for all to carry out, nor with incidental ad hoc instructions, but with the continuing agreement of the Son's speech with the action of the Father. So that it's not just that the Father says, hey, Son, here's your divine plan, go figure it out. But no, the Father is continuing to work in and through the Son in all of these works. Uh, so Vidu says, every action of Jesus is an action that originates with the Father in some sense. Okay, so in some sense, every action of Jesus is an action of the Father. So in light of that clarification I made at the beginning, we're talking about inseparable operations, because okay, I think this is what people misunderstand. We're saying that the work originates with the Father, but is worked through the Son, so that the work of the Son is the work of the Father. And so this, this is, seems to be what John is saying here, that whatever the Father is doing, that work of the Father is the work of the Son. So the Son does the work of the Father. And, and the argument here that Vidu is going to make as we move on into the text, because we, we, as we've talked about already, the accusation toward Jesus here is that, he, that he's making himself equal with God. And it's in response to that that Jesus starts saying this. So the question that's often asked then is, well, what is he saying in response? What, what, what is Jesus, not just what is he saying, but what is he trying to kind of refute here of what the Pharisees are saying? What's motivating what he's saying? Is, is Jesus, in other words, saying, they say he's making himself equal with God and Jesus is, is kind of stepping back and saying, oh no, I'm actually not because I'm just doing what the Father does. So really he's the one who's God and I'm just kind of his agent and not divine. It's one way that Arians historically have tried to understand these kinds of texts. Is that what's going on? Well, Vidu argues that no, what Jesus is refuting is the idea that he is making himself equal with God. He's saying, I'm not making myself equal with God. I have not done something to become some kind of new quasi-divine agent. No, I am God. That's like inherently who I am. I'm not making myself to be that way. That's just the essence of actually how things are. Uh, so he says in on page 40, there was a breaking up in the agency motif without parallel in the literature. Continuing the theme of life-giving power, Jesus claims in, in verse 26 that as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Now, life and authority are not simply carried by Jesus, but inhere in him. Christ is not mere representative, an agent of God, but the one in whom the power and the authority of God reside. And so it is that, that verse which is quite a, a statement, a, quite a bold statement and one that has um, certainly had its share of, of interpretations. So he says here, uh, I'm, I'm just in, in verse 26, 
Maybe I'll read verses 24 through through 26 here, since I read just the prior section. Uh, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from life into death. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So his voice, the voice of the Son, is that which brings life to the dead. In resurrection, is clearly in the Old Testament and in Jewish belief, this is a divine act. Final. This is tied to final judgment and the final resurrection, the final um, eschatological vindication of, of Israel. In verse 26, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. And so we have this this phraseology that as the Father has has life in Himself, uh, this is often summarized with the phrase aseity. God is is self existent. Uh, that doesn't mean that God is self caused. God cannot cause Himself, does not cause Himself, but He is dependent upon no one outside of Himself for His own existence. He simply is, and He He is. He has his being, his existence, apart from anything else in creation. He didn't gain anything about his existence or essence from anything else outside of himself. So he's saying this is true of the Father. The Father has this life in himself. And also, the Son has life in himself. So that the Son is, the the phrase that's sometimes used is autotheos, and there's a debate in the Reformed world about how this whole autotheos thing works, because sometimes it's argued that there is no kind of derivative divine nature in the Son. There's a total redefinition of eternal generation. So if you look at someone like Scott Oliphant, they've done all sorts of weird things with eternal generation, but it comes from Calvin. Lee Irons has a really good article on this. If you go to his site, Upper Register, I think that's still his website. I think it's still up. Um, you could find a Lee Irons article on Calvin on eternal generation, which is very helpful to understand and explain this. So if you want to read more about that, because I know people have asked me about that, I made a reference to it before, look up um, Lee Irons' generation, eternal generation. You should be able to, to find that. It's an it's a extremely good essay uh, and very helpful to understand the nuances of that, that Trinitarian debate. All right. So, But what it seems to be saying is the son has... He, he is ase, he is of himself, he has life in himself, and it's been granted from the Father. So this divine quality of aseity or self-existence is the property of the Father and of the Son. But it flows, just as we're speaking about here, from Father to Son. This is because the one divine essence is begotten as the Son, eternally. So that there is a kind of, we could say, even a a derivative aseity, because there is a derivation of the divine essence from the Father to the Son, eternally, um, that we're talking about with with eternal generation. And so what we see here is that Jesus has divine authority to do things like execute judgment and to speak so that the dead are raised because of something that is ontologically true about him. That's true about his being. So, so the reason why he, he can do divine things is because there's something about his being that is divine, that he has self-existence from and through the Father. So that these works that are generally attributed to the Father are worked through the Son. So there is this one working. And what this doesn't mean is that, well, hey, now the Father has something to do with final judgment. No, but the Father has given it to the Son. The divine work is done through, in and through the Son. Just as, as Jesus is saying here, the works that the Son does are the works of the Father. He doesn't do anything of his own accord. In fact, according to his divine nature, he has one will with the Father. According to his human nature, he has a human will as well. But, which is the doctrine of diotheletism, understanding there there are two wills in Christ, a divine will and a human will. But we're talking about one energy, one power, one will, that is worked from Father through Son, so that when the Son is doing these works that he describes in John, that actually is the work of the Father. And and I think it's pretty significant as well when we look at verse 21, 
where it says, as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, so the father's the one who raises the dead and gives life to them, but just as the father does it, the son gives life, but it doesn't say here, I think it's significant, it doesn't say here the son gives life to those whom the father wills that the son gives life, which is kind of how this discourse has gone, that's what we would expect. But the son gives life to whom he will. In other words, as the father is the one who wills who is raised, so also the son is the one who, through whose will we are raised. In other words, it's the same will. Like the son through his will, which is the will of the father. Because there is a unity of divine will between father and son. So let's talk about this then. If with what I'm saying, with the question, a lot of people read this and say, well, again, it sounds like the son is dependent on the father. So there's a difference between the working of the father and the son. Uh, Vidu answers this on page 41. He says, there is no tension between Jesus' equality with God and his dependency upon the Father. So he can both be one with the Father as God, but also dependent upon the Father. It will be argued at a later point that such attention would obtain were Jesus and God two distinct beings on their own right. So if they were two distinct beings and Jesus was dependent upon the Father, that would be a kind of subordinationism. However, within the unity of the one God of Israel as is assumed throughout John, because he's a Jewish monotheist, a confession of unity with the Father, i.e. I and the Father are one, can follow in the same context after the Father is greater than I, which is confusing for everybody. Right? The Father is greater than I. Uh, that, that is the, the text, that's the key text for the Arian point of view. The, the Arian heresy grabs onto that the Father is greater than I and just harps on that over and over and over and over and over again. And there are a couple of different ways to understand that. But within that exact same context, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. So what, is, what does he mean by that? Now, of course, there are two ways to interpret that text that are orthodox. Um, the one is that Jesus is speaking about his humanity, which is what we see in the Nicene Creed, that he is equal with God with regard to his divinity, but he is less than the Father with regard to his humanity. Or we are speaking about the ordering of those operations so that things originate with the Father and then work themselves through the Son. Um, but there being one divine essence, as Jesus says there, I and the Father are one. This doesn't make Jesus less than the Father ontologically. But we could talk about that maybe another time and get into that particular text and different interpretations um, of, of that text. Now I'll just read a, this is kind of the summary statement of Vidu's section here. Jesus' claim of an inseparable operation with the Father is not aimed at clearing up the Jews' misunderstanding. He really is claiming equality with God, but the kind of equality he is claiming does not imply independence from the Father. There is another way of imagining equality with the Father, which, as Boltman has so rightly sensed, the Jews weren't aware of. They can only conceive equality with God as independence from God, whereas for Jesus it means the very opposite. So then we have a, a nec another text in John's Gospel that often uh, plays a role in a lot of these discussions about the nature of Christ and Christ, uh, the Son's relationship to the Father, uh, and that is John chapter 10. Uh, now, John chapter 10 is known very well as the, uh, the Good Shepherd Discourse. In our liturgical calendar, we have a Good Shepherd Sunday where we speak about Christ as uh, the Good Shepherd and, you know, a beautiful text, one of the, the most powerful texts in John's Gospel, Jesus speaking about his relationship to his people. Uh, also a text that Calvinists use as a defense for limited atonement, and I don't agree with their interpretation of the text, but that's, I guess, a little bit outside of uh, our purpose right now. But I'm just going to read uh, this. Let's see, I'll, I'll read uh, in, in John 10. I'm not going to read this the whole... Um, thing here, uh, but I will look at... I'll start at verse 25. Um, Jesus answered them. He's answering um, Jews who are asking if he is indeed the Messiah. Okay, 25. Jesus said to them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 
and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now there's the I and my Father are one text, which the Jews rightly understand is, if he weren't God, that would be blasphemy, because that's what he's claiming, right? If Jesus were not who he would say he said he was, then it would be blasphemy. Um, any ordinary person who says I and the Father are one, you know, you probably shouldn't believe them unless they're Jesus. Uh, so it, it, you can understand the weight of what Jesus is claiming about himself. He's fully aware of that weight that he's claiming about himself. And the Pharisees are rightly well aware of the weight of that kind of statement. Now, notice also that back and forth, you see throughout many of these texts in John's gospel um, that Jesus says things like, I give eternal life. You know, there is the I. Jesus is the one delivering eternal life to his people. Uh, no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. And then he goes on to say, my father has given them to me. So he's saying the father granted them to the son, but it's the son's working too. So it's the father's working and it's the son's working. And he goes right from no one shall snatch them out of my hands to no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. You see, there is this unity here in the act of of election and drawing people to himself. It's the Father's work, but it's the Father's work in and through the Son because he's granted it to the Son. So there is this unity of the working uh, from Father through Son, and it's in light of this working, this unity in work, that Jesus says, I and my Father are one. So the reason why there is this unity of working from Father through Son in terms of the granting of eternal life is that there is an ontological basis for it. It's not just a functional thing. So it's because of the oneness of the Father, the oneness of the Father and the Son constitutes the oneness of their work. Because they are divine works, and the divine works are the works of Father and Son. The Spirit isn't mentioned specifically here, but we're talking about the relationship between uh, the Father and the Son. We have to go to other texts to look at the Spirit. Then we look at verse 31, the Jews take up to took up stones uh, again to stone him, recognizing that, hey, he's claiming himself to be God and they think it's blasphemy. Then Jesus answered and says, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those good works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because they get it, because you being a man make yourself God. They get it, they get it. Jesus answers, Answered, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. So many key texts for so many doctrines here too. Uh, okay. Do you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. If you do not believe the works of my father, do not believe me because there's an identity between the works of the Father and the works of the Son. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So this is the, the perichoresis here. There is a unity of the perichoretic indwelling of the Father and the Son and the Son and the Father that is connected to the works of the Son that are the works of the Father. Because of the mutual indwelling and perichoresis, that which the Father does is that which what the Son does. So that in all actions of the Father, the Son is also present and working. In all actions of the Son, the Father is also present and working. And the same kind of thing would, would be true of the Spirit as well. All right. So, I'll read a quote here that's given from, from Balkum on page 43 of this text. He says, the in one another language that we were just talking about refers to the uniquely intimate communion that unites the Father and the Son. This strongly supports the view that the unity between Father and Son is not just a unity of will in Jesus' mission from the Father, but unity of words and works, inseparable operations, by which Jesus conveys what he has heard from the Father and does the works of the Father. Okay, then we have uh, John chapter 14, which is another one that is often addressed in some of these uh, conversations relating to inseparable operations and uh, the relationship between the Father and the Son. 
So I'll start reading from a little bit of John 14 here, starting in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And know where I go, sorry, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Knowing Jesus is knowing the Father. So that's interesting. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father's in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. A wonderful text, and there is so much rich Trinitarian theology that, that is in this text. I mean, we could spend hours on just each of these texts in John, just going through a careful exegesis of them, which maybe is worth is worthwhile. But let's just look at what implications this text has for the topic under discussion right now. Um, so first we have the unity of the Father and the Son is expressed in that the only way to the Father is through the Son. Well, why is it that the only way from the Father is through the Son? Is it just that God the Father has happened to have chosen a human person, Jesus, as his representative on earth to reveal himself? No, what Jesus says is that th this is due to the something ontological. This is due to the actual unity of the indwelling of the Father in the Son, and not just the Father in the Son, but also the Son in the Father. So this, this perichoretic indwelling between these two persons means that you cannot know the Father apart from knowing the Son. It is an impossibility because they share in one divine essence. So in verse 7, he says this, If you had known me, you would have known my Father. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. So if you know me, you know the Father. You cannot know Jesus without knowing the Father. You cannot know the Father without knowing the Son. That's how, that's how close Father and Son are. They are not two separable beings that you can have access to one and not have access to the other, but they mutually indwell one another so that if you know one, you know the other. You don't encounter the Father apart from the Son and Spirit. You don't encounter Jesus apart from the Father and Spirit. You don't encounter the Spirit apart from the Father and Son. Um, and then, so, so he says here, Philip says to him, Show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. Because Philip doesn't understand this unity of relations between Father and Son yet at this point. And that's when Jesus is like, come on, Philip, you know me for so long and you still don't get this. Um, he who has seen me has seen the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Now, this could be taken, right? And, and this is a text that one, the oneness Pentecostals and others will take and say, look, Jesus says he is the Father. Uh, because, you know, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So the Father is Jesus. But is that really what Jesus goes on to say? Does he say, because I am the Father? He never uses that kind of language, ever. No. He says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? So they indwell one another. He doesn't say, I am the Father. He says, no, the Father is in me. So that if you have encountered me, you have encountered the one in me. And if you encounter the Father, you encounter the one in him. It's impossible to encounter one and not the other. And when you start to separate the works of the triune persons, like some social Trinitarians do, this wouldn't seem to fit very well. Because some works supposedly are the work of only the Son or only the Father. But you have to have at least some kind of inseparable operation. Now, there are different ways of formulating it. But you have to have some kind of inseparable operations for this to really work. Because if they're not inseparable, then you can encounter the Father alone or the Son alone. Because it's a work of the Father or a work of the Son. But inseparable operations says, no, this is a triune work of the Father and Son. 
so that if you encounter the Father, you encounter the Son. If you encounter the Son, you encounter the Father, because it's the same work. And they're all involved in all the same works. The triune work is a triune work. There's no work that's just a Father work, Son work, or Spirit work. It's all triune works through Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay. Do you not believe that I am in the Father? The Father is in me. So he's speaking about ontology, the nature of God's being. And then he says, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me. Again, this makes no sense if you're a, if you're a, a modalist. Because what is Jesus even saying? Or he's speaking about just his human nature and not his divine. Uh, but that interpretation doesn't work for a number of reasons. But he's saying, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father. So there's still this distinction between Father and the Son. But the works of the Son are the works of the Father. The Father who dwells in me does the works. That doesn't mean Jesus doesn't do the works. Because repeatedly, I mean, he talks about his works that are his works. So the works that show forth Jesus' divine power are also the works of the Father. Similarly, these works repeatedly throughout the Gospels are attributed to the Holy Spirit. So that the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father are all said to be the originators of the works of Jesus in his life. So that the will of Jesus in his, his divinity working through everything he does in life, is also the action of the Father and Spirit. Because there's this mutual indwelling. So he's saying because of what's true ontologically, that the Father and the Son indwell one another, that means that any work of the Son is also a work of the Father. So believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Um, and... Then, then he go, actually goes on to speak about the Holy Spirit pretty much right after this, and, and he talks about more about this, this indwelling as we get into verse 19 and, and on. Um, but you can read the rest of that chapter. But um, this discussion, I hope has helped to clarify some of these things for you, because I know that there's a lot of confusion around the topic, this topic of inseparable operations. And again, I get it. When we're talking about Trinitarian theology, we're talking about difficult things. We're talking about deep things that um, we're, we're trying to take revelation as it is, as God has delivered it to us, and have the, as the saints in the past have formulated things, uh, and as God has guided the church with particular ways to speak about these issues. It's not easy for us to understand. Of course it isn't. This is the kind of depths of theology. This is tough stuff. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not saying that as... You know, those who are pastors listening that you need to go preach to your congregation every week on inseparable operations. But these categories do help us because they are biblical ones. And they certainly help us when we are looking at these texts to start to piece the texts together and these doctrines together to say, okay, that's what's going on here in this text. Um, that's why Jesus speaks this way about the Father. And... It helps us to avoid using phraseology or terms or ways of explaining things that would divorce the persons from one another in a way that goes far beyond what Scripture allows us to. Um, anyway, so I, I just I think that this doctrine of inseparable operations I think it's pretty key. It's something that you find in when you go back to a lot of the Lutheran Orthodox sources they talk about it all the time. I mean constantly, and, and not not just in their Volumes on the Doctrine of God. Uh, I mean, if you read, you know, I was just reading, you know, Widener recently again, and he's, every time he talks about like a work of Christ or a work of, of redemption, he goes on to say, whose work is it? Well, it's the work of the Father, it's the work of the Son, and it's the work of the Spirit, because they all work together. Uh, Gerhard does that. This is pretty, very common. And it's really only in recent history with the rise of social Trinitarianism that that has, that has changed. Uh, this is a doctrine that was very much taken for granted throughout the Western church as as it developed in the post-Augustinian age, particularly. Not to say that there's no such thing as inseparable operations prior to that, but especially post-Augustine. And this isn't something that's just attributable to Thomas Aquinas. I know that there's a lot of debate about Thomas Aquinas these days and his relation to Protestantism and what we should do with Thomas Aquinas. Take Aquinas out of the equation altogether and you still have the doctrine. I mean, whatever, you get rid of Aquinas. I don't really want to get rid of Aquinas. I like Aquinas, but uh, but even if you did, it doesn't essentially change the Western tradition. Like it's it's not like this is some novelty with Aquinas. Uh, this is this is all very much in Augustine. 
and in an earlier fathers. And, and ultimately, I'm saying it's in John. Like, J John is really the foundation of this in these various texts in John's gospel. It's not only John's gospel, but John does seem to give the clearest implication or indications of this doctrine in his text. So uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Make sure you do subscribe if you haven't already. I know a lot of you that watch aren't subscribed, and you should. Uh, I'm very close to 30,000. I'm trying to hit that number. So help me out there if you can. And uh, if you haven't subscribed on your podcast app, you can also just get the audio there as well. It's usually posted about a week after the video is. Um, so anyway, thanks so much for watching and or listening, and we'll see you in the next one. God bless.